Hello class, this is the lecture on the civil war in Syria and the rise and fall of what some people call ISIS, other people call Daesh, and I'll come to explain the differences in names in a minute, uh, which was scheduled for uh, May 5th. Uh, this is the last lecture of the semester, so at the end I will give you a little bit of update on the um, format and for the final. Uh, I also would like to say uh, this, well, I'll say all the announcements about the finals at the end. So, the, the, what has happened in Syria since uh, the beginning of Arab Spring in 2011 is obviously one of the greatest disasters that the world has seen since the end of World War II. Uh, in the course of the fighting, uh, we don't know how many people. The UN has a, a relatively low estimate of numbers. UN says it's about uh, 400,000 people have died in the fighting. Other estimates go almost as high as, as three quarters uh, of a million. But more important in terms of, of the future of the world uh, is the number of refugees. And during the course of the fighting, uh, over half of the Syrian population has been displaced from its original homes. Um, some of those are internal, but there are well over three and a half million uh, Syrian refugees in Turkey. There are about a million uh, Syrian refugees in Lebanon and about a million in Jordan. So that makes uh, five and a half million uh, total. But if you consider that the, the wave of refugees that Germany took in in 2015, 2016, they took, Germany took in over a million refugees, uh, over half of those. Uh, were from the, from Syria, so we're we're talking about a refugee population that is somewhere around six million people, and if you think about the impact that the Palestinian refugee situation created has created for the Middle East since uh, 1948, and if you think that that population was was roughly a half a million that was displaced out of Israel when Israel was created in 48, um, there's 10 times, at least 10 times more uh, Syrians. So the future of the world, I think, I, I worry about the, the possibility of radicalization among refugees and the, the potential for ongoing trouble. Uh, so it's a very important place for you to keep your eyes on and to be aware of what's going on there. And it's also a good way to end this semester because it is in, in the Syrian conflict and how people align, we see, we can see a lot of the things I've mentioned in earlier, the forces coming together, the role of Saudi Arabia, the role of Iran, the role of Turkey, uh, United States, um, the whole, what led up to the, the Syrian civil war is, is a complicated story that involves the United States involvement in Iraq. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it, it ties lots together. It also ties together the whole colonial enterprise because one of the things that ISIS wanted to do was to get rid of all the borders. It said the borders that were created by the Europeans, that is the border between Jordan and Syria, Syria and uh, Iraq, uh, Lebanon and Israel, and they want to get rid of Israel completely. Um, those are all artificial created by the Europeans and don't reflect the wants of the, the people of the region. So in other words, it is, you can see the rise of ISIS as the, tw the events of the 20th century coming full circle and back around and biting itself in the tail. I mean, it really is a, uh, a complicated story that has its origins in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, so let's, where do we begin? Well, let's begin with Syria. Syria is, uh, was a, before the civil war, uh, was a medium-sized country. That is, it had about a population of 23 million uh, total. Of that population, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's divided uh, by religion and by uh, ethnicity. About 10% of that population is Kurdish. And although they are Sunnis, uh, they don't ever identify really uh, with the Arab Sunnis. I mean, their, their identity is very much tied into being Kurdish. Um, <clears throat> so when we talk about 
the Syrian population, we say it's 90% Arab, that is 90% of the population speaks Arabic as their first language and 10% Kurdish. And then we look at the Arab population and we say, well, how is that divided? And there we usually divide it up according to uh, religion. And here we don't have any firm numbers. Uh, the, the usually guesstimate was that 12% of the population is Alawi, the people I've mentioned before, and I'll talk a little bit more about in just a minute. But uh, the Economist has done some fairly interesting uh, studies on, on, on uh, birth rates and things that are available, not by religion, just by region. And they actually said that the Alawi area, which is the Mediterranean coast, uh, if you look at a map of Syria and you locate the, the town of Latakia, which is pronounced in Arabic, Latia, uh, that is the kind of the largest city in the what's called the Alawi heartland. So the Alawis are concentrated in the mountains um, along the Mediterranean coast. They fled there partly because they were despised uh, by the Sunnis. They were seen as heretics by the Sunnis. And I've, I've spoken to you earlier about their religious beliefs. And you can see why, if you are a Sunni, they are, they are in fact heretics. They're not Muslim. They're not even, uh, although today the Iran says that they are officially Shia, they're not even officially Shia. They're, they're beyond that in their, in their beliefs. Uh, are too extreme even for the mainstream Shia clergy, but for political reasons. The leadership in Iran has, st has stated that the uh, Alawis of Syria are authentically Shia. Um, so there are, as I said, they're about 10, 12%, but the, the Economist, which is a pretty reliable uh, journal, magazine published in Britain, says they're really probably down less than 10%. Okay, so what's the rest? The usual, uh, uh, guesstimate is that 65% of the total Syrian population were Sunni Muslims. So the majority are Sunni Muslims. And again, because of the birth rates, we actually think it's higher that in 2011, uh, Sunnis had the highest birth rate in uh, Syria. Uh, so, but anyway, let's just say that. So let's say, let's just say 10%, um, uh, so start again, 10% are Kurds. So that would make 90% Arabs. Of the total population, then 65% is uh, uh, Sunni Muslim. And then you add the Kurds at 75%. So you've got 25% left. And 10% generally is seen as the number of Christians. Although, again, that's probably inflated because Christian birth rates were the lowest in Syria. The, the education rates was the highest. Uh, Christians tended to get married much later than Muslims. Uh, so they have fewer children. Uh, but anyway, let's just say 10%. And then so if we say 10% uh, Alawi, then we've got, what is it, this 85, so 85% more. And the other 5% then are these various Shia groups, some of which are in fact Imami Shia. There is a relatively small Imami Shia community in Syria historically. But there are also other kinds of Shia, Zaidi Shia, the Druzes, which uh, are important in Lebanon. Uh, and their Druze population in Syria as well. So it's a, it's a mix. And the, the part of the problem for Syria uh, in the 20th century was unlike Egypt or unlike Turkey, um, it had a hard time creating what is Syria. For one thing, historically, Syria was much larger. Syria uh, in Arabic was called Balad sham the country of Sham. Sham is Arabic, another word for Damascus. And that pretty much included what is today Lebanon, Israel, Jordan. It didn't include Northern Syria. The Northern Syria is uh, dominated by the town of Aleppo. And so the medieval and the early modern people in, in Syria, although they called what we might call Southern Syria and the coast, that's the Lada Sham or the country of Damascus. Aleppo was always Halib, different, different place. Um, but roughly speaking, then, the Syrians, in terms of their dialect, their, their customs, uh, they're the same pe people as the Lebanese, the Jordanians, and the Palestinians. So when Syria is created uh, by the French and the British, it's a truncated Syria. So there is a, a movement, there was a movement among Syrians to talk about a greater Syria, to try to incorporate all of these culturally similar regions under one state, with Damascus as its capital. But under the Ba'ath, as we've, uh, we hope you've picked up by now, the Ba'ath uh, emphasizes Arab unity 
uh, regardless of country, and that the Arab unity then is from Morocco to Kuwait. Uh, so it's all the Arabic-speaking people is one nationality. So for Syrians in the 20th century, for Syrian government, it, they've always been uh, kind of conflicted on what do they mean by Syria? Uh, does it have a, you know, an organic identity in the way that, say, Turkey does, or Iran does, or Egypt has? Um, and the answer is no, it doesn't. Uh, and so the Ba'ath then played down the, as you remember, the Ba'ath was founded by a, a Christian and a, a Sunni Muslim. They played down the religion by saying that religion was a part of the Arab culture. Islam was a part of the Arab culture. In other words, uh, the Arabs created Islam, not the other way around. Islam did not create the glory of the Arabs, which is what most Muslim oriented people would say. They would say that Islam or God choosing Muhammad as his prophet uh, empowered the Arabs to become a great people. The Ba'ath interpretation is the opposite, that the Arab genius creates the Quran. And so Islam is, a, is not a manifestation of God's will, but rather a manifestation of the Arab nation. Uh, so there's tension there, obviously. Uh, and but because of the fact that since uh, the mid 60s and more after 1970, 1970, Hafez al Assad uh, was a head of the Air Force, uh, took power in Syria during the, uh, the trouble with Jordan. In Jordan, remember the, what was called uh, Black September when the Jordanian army moved against the PLO in Jordan. The Syrian army actually mobilized and was moving toward to invade uh, Jordan and the uh, Jordanian Air Force went up and the Israeli Air Force went up too. The Israelis didn't actually do anything, but they were ready to support the Jordanians against the Syrians. Um, the Jordanians bombed the, the, the tanks coming toward their border and the, the Syrian Air Force didn't respond. And that was because Hafez al-Assad was planning to seize power. He seized power and from his, his reign, he reigned for 30 years from 1970 to 2000 when he died. And he, his reign was, he is an Alawi. All of the people around him were Alawis. Uh, he did pick a couple of token um, Sunni Muslims who were from his village or villages near his village. So it was very much uh, a clique of people uh, surrounding the, the president. And in his regime, which was a regime of terror, um, the secret police dominated the country. Uh, but there also, were trade-offs that he empowered the rural people. So he, he spent what resources the, the state had on improving the lives of rural people, electrification, uh, bringing in drinking water. Uh, I mentioned when I talk, we talked about water resources, he built the uh, Al Thawra Dam on the Euphrates, which greatly helped uh, irrigation in the, the Euphrates River Valley. So under his reign, there was both a carrot and a stick. The stick was the secret police. The carrot was the, the rising uh, economic level of the rural, of rural Syria. Urban Syrians suffered. He, uh, he confiscated the banks. He confiscated the uh, industry. Uh, the only private um, uh, enterprise that was allowed was restaurants and some clothing shops, uh, those were all allowed uh, to be held in private hands. And that meant that the old, and a lot of the land, the land was confiscated. So the old Sunni elite of, uh, of Syria, which had dominated it before the coming of the French, uh, they were resentful. And as I mentioned earlier, they tended to, uh, their opposition was channeled into the Muslim Brotherhood, which led to the series of uprisings that I, I mentioned um, between 1979 and in 1982, um, which was largely uh, channeled by uh, Sunni, middle-class Sunnis in the cities. So the, the big cities of, of Syria are Damascus, the capital, and Aleppo in the north, which is where most of the industry is located. And then there are two regional cities on the way down in between, and they're Homa and Homs. Uh, Hama was the one that was devastated by the uprising in 1982, but Homs also had a, a similar kind of population that is a very Sunni, very traditional population, and it then will be a major player in the civil war. So um, that, 
when he dies in 2000, the leadership was kind of caught by surprise because they had hoped that his son, Basil, who was being trained to be a ruthless follower of his father, he had killed, he'd been killed in a car accident uh, in uh, 2005. And so they had put off really making a decision, the leadership around the, the generals and around uh, the uh, Hafez al-Azad had put off deciding what to do. <coughs> but with, his, with the death of Hafez, uh, they decided they would bring ba Bashar um, back. And Bashar had been the kind of the, the not so vicious member of the family. He had been sent to England to study ophthalmology. Uh, he had married um, in England, he had married a daughter of a Syrian um, Sunni family um, who was trained, grew up in Britain um, and spoke, speaks, you know, perfect English. Uh, and Bashar actually speaks pretty good English as well, but his wife speaks you know, impeccable English. Uh, so they were kind of this, you know, this kind of beautiful couple that uh, the world embraced when uh, the, the Syrian official said he's going to come back and he's going to be the pre president. Uh, and they brought him back from England, and he was at that time only 34 years old. So he's you know, a young guy. He's tall. His wife is tall. They're both very photogenic. They were on Vogue magazine. They were on, um, you know, 60 Minutes had interviews with them. And they're this very, you know, lovely, uh, fluent English-speaking couple that this looks the new face of Syria. And he said that one of his things was, uh, one of his ambitions was to put the internet in every Syrian home. And there was a brief flurry, uh, they call it the Damascus Spring, uh, as opposed to the Arab Spring. And the Damascus Spring was in 2001, and there were, they, the government lifted for a while uh, the limitations on meetings. And so people could, before the, uh, the spring, the, limita the lifting of limitation, you could only have 10 people in a room at any given time. So that, that made it impossible for any kind of organizations to meet without government approval or a government mind or a spy that would be there. Uh, so that was lifted. And so you get, you know, the cultural life starts to look like it's going to boom. He also says he's going to open up um, to private enterprise. And uh, the industrialists, the money that was spent up, um, had been, a lot of it had gone to Europe. The Syrians had taken their money out uh, when the nationalization took place. It came back and, and you see a real boom in Aleppo. Aleppo starts creating all these factories making clothing. I, I had worked on Aleppo. That was the area that I did my PhD on. And I hadn't been there uh, almost 30 years. And I went there in 2004 and I was just kind of surprised how booming it was. And there, there were you know, shops and factories everywhere. And that was part of the liberalization. He also then allowed for the creation of private uh, restaurants, uh, more fancy restaurants, um, and also the creation of boutique hotels. So, a lot of the wives of the generals took it on themselves to refurbish these old Ottoman era houses, both in Aleppo and Damascus, and turn them into either boutique hotels or um, boutique restaurants. Uh, and at the same time, they also started talking about establishing private schools, which was really unusual for a state that had been so centrally controlled. But what it, it showed, and unfortunately for the Syrian people, it, it, it wasn't open. It was, uh, it was very much controlled by the, the elites. And so it's what we, uh, we like to call a, 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 a well, crony capitalism. That was the word, phrase I'm trying to, in other words, who you know uh, is who, you, who gets rich. And so most of the people who got rich were people who were around the Assad family or around the elites. I mean, for example, one of the richest men were the Makhlouf family. And the Makhlouf, uh, Hafez Makhlouf, was um, married to Bashar al-Assad's sister. Uh, and so there were a lot of families that, uh, and he was in charge of all telecommunications. So cell phones were allowed into Syria. Uh, uh, disc, uh, television discs were allowed in so you could get you know, remote. Uh, that was all owned by the Mahlouf family. So they were becoming multimillionaires off of this opening up. At the same time, they were cutting off uh, economic development aid. So they, the government uh, had, uh, had been spending disproportionately in building schools and clinics and various other things. That stopped 
uh, or was greatly reduced. Now, as a result of that earlier spending, Syria's population was really booming. Uh, Syria went from, I think I have it down here, it had 3 million people in 1950, and by 2010, so 60 years later, it had 23 million people. And that is a result of, um, of the better health and uh, uh, living standards of the, of the Syrian population. Um, most Syrians went to school, uh, even women, which is unusual in the less developed countries in the Middle East. It's often a big percentage gap. In, in Syria, it was pretty close. Men and women were roughly equal in going to school. Um, but what that meant is that you're, you're getting a generation, and by 2010, uh, half the population is under 25. And so you have a, a very young population uh, that uh, has been educated, or relatively well educated, and doesn't feel like it has any voice in the government or any voice in the economy. The economy is, is although it's booming, it's, um, it's, not, it's low paid work, it's factory work in the north, and it's service industry, tourist industry, which was starting to take off in 2010. Uh, I know that I, I talked to people working in uh, one of the bigger tourist agencies in the United States, they were they are, they are already planning on on having regular organized tours for Americans to go to Syria. And I also know that the programs for teaching Arabic, there's a program that's a, a consortium that's run by American universities teaching Arabic. And formerly, they they had always been in Cairo. Uh, in 20, 2009, they were they were seriously uh, negotiating with the Syrian government to open up a campus in Damascus for American graduate students to study Arabic in Damascus. Uh, and so there was this whole look of, oh, Syria is changing, you know, it's really becoming modern and, and uh, opening to the West. But it was, again, it was, it was largely facade because in the interior, the, the secret police were still in control. Uh, and the Syria started to suffer from starting in 2005. I mentioned this earlier on the question of ecology and water. Syria started suffering a, a really serious drought between 2005 and 2010. Uh, it, is, it was cushioned by the fact that it has the dam, so the, the, there is water resources, but it was the, the, the level of the water because of the, the not being any rain and also the, the in, in hot countries, one of the problems of, of dams is the um, evaporation uh, accelerates when there's dry weather. And so there was less water to be used. And so it displaced um, uh, people already. So it's estimated that uh, people I know who, who worked on Syria were there, uh, diplomats, uh, said that they thought that the about a million to a million and a half people were already displaced by 2010. So where did these people go? And this is important because it, 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 you can see where the hot spots develop in 2011, 2012. They are in those areas where these displaced people went. Because what happened between 20 well, let's say 1990. 1990 and 2010, uh, the, with the population booming, most Syrian cities started to have, uh, I you could call them slums, um, but they look more substantial than slums in, in, say, Africa or Latin America, in that they are tend to be concrete, uh, concrete block buildings, especially several stories high. So you drive by them and you know that they're not a good not a good neighborhood in terms of, of infrastructure because the roads won't be paved. So there'll be dirt roads, but there'll be three-story, four-story apartment blocks, one right after another. Now what happens see, is the Syrians, when they have any money at all, they put it into real estate and then they build apartment blocks. And since they have extended families, usually if you see a three or four-story, uh, looks like to us, an apartment block, it will be one family. It'll be the cousins and the Everybody else that's related will all be there. So it doesn't look so much like a, like a third world slum, but it, in some ways it is in terms of infrastructure. They probably won't have running water. They probably won't have that good connection to electricity. They won't have schools. They won't have clinics. So those kinds of, of, of makeshift uh, towns started to grow all around uh, the major cities, but they grew especially in areas where uh, people were tribal had tribal people had settled. And so their cousins and second cousins and third cousins who were living out in the Euphrates Valley as the, the, the drought happened, they came into the city seeking help from their kinsmen and the kinsmen would then put them up in 
those places. So it didn't, it didn't look as impoverished as it actually was. And that's a key point. And these, town, these, these suburb towns that grew up, they're around uh, in, in Damascus is surrounded by an oasis. And the reason Damascus is there is it has been there. And some people say it's the oldest continually inhabited city in the world is it has a very fertile oasis that's large. It's, uh, I think it's something like a hundred square, no, it's not that high, 50 square miles. So it's to the south and uh, east of the city. It's, uh, the water runs through it. The, the water comes down from the mountains of Lebanon and run through uh, Damascus. And that's what creates the, the kind of oasis. And so it's very intense truck farming there, the vegetables and fruits. Uh, are very famous. Uh, Damascus fruits and vegetables are famous throughout the region, and also roses and other kinds of flowers and things. But anyway, that that area, which had been very agricultural, small farms, it starts to have these apartment blocks growing up. And also to the uh, west of the city, which had been desert, there were these apartment blocks going up. Uh, so that when I drove into uh, Damascus from uh, Beirut in 2004, I was just struck by how far out the city had gone. There's a you kind of drive in the mountain pass and you come into the city. Well, the, before you got to the mountain pass, there were already these high rise uh, concrete structures. Uh, and that was, they hadn't been there 10 years before. Uh, so there was a lot of, of this, but it was a lot of urban misery too. I want to get across. That's the main point. So when you get to the, when the demonstrations start in Tunisia uh, and then spread to Egypt, you begin to get uh, people in Syria also uh, thinking, well, that's maybe we can do it. So the demonstrations start. And the difference is, and it's very, there's a lot of key differences. One of the, the key differences is that the, remember I told you Al Jazeera played a really important part in uh, the fall of Egypt and, and Tunisia, that the, the Al Jazeera was putting forward a Muslim brother image, um, I mean, to report the Muslim brothers, and they didn't do that initially in, in Syria. And, um, you know, commentators have tried to figure out why, and they think, well, they thought that maybe stability, that Syria, remember Libya had broken apart, it was, it was being devastated by civil war, and and uh, maybe that Syria, they should just let it lie because Iraq also next door was, was, was troubled. Uh, and uh, the Saudis were hesitant about getting involved in Syria. The Turks uh, were key. Uh, Erdogan had been cultivating Syria the, the year, two years before the, the 2011, uh, Turkey had signed agreements with uh, Syria making free trade. So there's no tariffs on trade between Syria and Turkey and the towns in Southern Turkey along the border were starting to be booming with trade and manufacturing for Syrian consumers. Uh, also no visas, so Syrians could come to Turkey freely uh, and Turks could go to Syria. It was more than Syrians wanting to come to Turkey than the Turks wanting to go to Syria. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, it was open. So Erdogan thought he had some leverage with I'm sorry, with Bashar al-Assad. And so at the beginning, when the demonstrations start, um, there isn't a lot of support in the world for the Syrians, unlike the case of the Egyptians, unlike the case of in Tunis, uh, in part because the Syrians are, are very strict on who they're letting in. So the coverage isn't, doesn't get, you don't have anchors from the United States or Britain uh, broadcasting nightly from Damascus the way you have them broadcasting from Cairo. And so it's kind of below the surface what's going on in Syria, but the demonstrations start happening. And then we have this really horrible situation in the south, town of Dera, which is down near the Jordanian border. It's a, it's a market town. Its population is largely descended from Bedouin tribes. It also was a place where a lot of the people who had been displaced from the Euphrates Valley came. Uh, so it was, a, uh, and it was over, overwhelmingly a Sunni town. Uh, and the people there started, young men started demonstrating, and then they started being disappearing and being, the bodies were brought back, mutilated and tortured, really terrible, really terrible things were done to these young guys, teenage, mostly teenagers. Uh, and the, 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 the police there just went wild, and they started shooting at people, and that then started to get some coverage. Um, the regime decided they, they would transfer the governor who was there, and that they would try to put on a, a good face in the summer of 2011, that they were going to be 
uh, much more um, uh, think about what the people are asking. And uh, they had an election uh, during that summer. Uh, and they thought they had kind of managed it, but then it starts popping up again, and it pops up in Homs, which was uh, a, ver a very large, uh, I think it's the third largest city of Syria, um, it was an industrial city, but it also had these, a uh, lot of the brothers had been there. It's a very Sunni traditional town, although it has a, a fairly large Christian population as well. Um, it, the demonstration started there, and there what you had is the Iranians have been sending their people, their, their secret police, to Syria and giving them advice. And they say, well, you've got to do what we did in 2009. That is, you have to shoot them down. That's the way that you end the, the uprising, is you, you just kill hundreds of people and the, they'll go home. So they started doing that. And you then get uh, a break up of the, the Syrian army. And the Syrian army is a conscript army, like all the armies in the region. It's mostly Sunni. The officer corps is almost entirely Alawi or religion, minority religion, so they're Christian officers, uh, Druze officers. Um, and uh, the officers then are ordering the people to fight, but the, the soldiers are not so, so, so eager. So here you get some other players, and these will all be on the notes that I will have posted for you. I'll just I'll give you this names and one is the the Mukhabarat, the the secret police which is which is fairly large in Syria uh, there were, were several different secret police units I mean I had a uh, a father-in-law a good friend of mine um, in Syria was a general in one of the secret police groups units what I'm gonna call them and he told me once he said Bruce if you're ever arrested by the police or arrested by people wearing uniform, use my name and I can help you. Uh, they'll let you go. But if they're not wearing uniforms, not even I can help you. So there were, you know, units within units within units. And the most select and the most loyal groups were all made up of Alois. In addition, you have these, um, we call them vigilantes, you can call them thugs, uh, who had been operating pretty much as uh, gangsters in uh, before 2011 they were smuggling smuggling drugs smuggling consumer goods from syria um, from lebanon into syria they were involved in all kinds of, of shady operations uh they were largely concentrated in the alawite alawite country because that's the connects if you look on the map that's the coastline is between lebanon and turkey so the, the, the major way of transporting things um, between the countries is in their territory and these groups emerge, and they're called Shabiha. And I've asked many Syrians, and they all give me opposite different reasons why we call them Shabiha, because it doesn't, the word is, is Shara. There is a Shara, which means ghost. Uh, but no one thinks it's related to ghosts. But, you know, some people said it's the name of them. They drive gray Mercedes, and we used to call those Shabi. And so you get all kinds of, but they, they come to be known as the Shabiha. And the Shabiha then are, are men with heavily armed with automatic weapons, don't wear uniforms, uh, have their own cars, and they start terrorizing uh, Sunni villages. They, they, they rape, they murder, um, they burn, uh, and they are, they're basically trying to use mafia-style tactics of intimidation to, to threaten, especially in the mountain regions where there are Muslim, some Muslim villages, those Sunni Muslim villages, those are attacked by the Shabiha. So by already by 2011, you are getting a, a rapidly deteriorating situation in Syria, uh, despite what uh, Bashar al-Assad is saying about uh, liberal reforms. And um, it's, it's seen on the ground in that you start to have, there, start, there began to be defections from the Syrian army. Uh, Sunni soldiers don't want to fight to suppress other Sunnis. So they desert, and you get a movement called the Free Syrian Army that emerges with several, um, not high-ranking, but middle-ranking officers who defect from uh, the army and then say that they are going to be the free army of Syria and they're going to you know, fight for democracy in Syria. And they then become a nucleus of, of opposition. Um, the opposition uh, by the fall of 2011 is starting to get uh, 
of recognition from international sources, uh, especially Turkey. Turkey had hoped that they could control um, Assad and move toward liberalization. Uh, that wasn't happening. And so by the fall of, of 2011, Erdogan becomes the first world leader to say that uh, Havas Lassad has to go. And that's a key turning point because it's, it's the first time that a world leader says that uh, this, is, this regime is, is the problem. There needs to be a kind of a uh, negotiations in Syria. Um, and, but the primary to start the negotiations, Hafez, I'm sorry, I said Hafez, Bashar, Bashar al-Assad will have to go as, as president. All right, so the, the, the Alawi group um, closes around him, you know, circle the wagons, and the, uh, the fighting intensifies. And with that, then the other states in the region, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, um, start to change their attitude as well. And they also see uh, Bashar al-Assad as the problem. And in the, the winter of, I think it's January of 2012, Obama says that, the, that Syria needs to be uh, moved to a democracy, and maybe that means that, uh, that uh, Bashar al-Assad should go. Well, that was, the, that was the impetus to the rebels. They said, oh, look, 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 it's like Libya. It's like Libya, exactly. Um, the, the Americans are going to step in. The Americans are all powerful. Um, we are going to, you know, it's, our freedom is just down the corner, around the corner. It'll, it'll be here soon. Uh, but it didn't happen. America, uh, Obama did not want to, to get involved. He did put a, what's called the famous uh, green line, I'm sorry, red line. Red line, he said that, um, you know, if they cross it by using poison gas, weapons of mass destruction, then we will, something will have to be done. And the Syrians took that to mean, well, there's going to be intervention. Um, and so uh, in 2012, also, yeah, so you start to get the, get the Free Syrian movement in, in uh, on bases are in Turkey. And then the Turks host in 2012, they host a, a, what they hope will be a convention of various Syrian intellectuals and political opposition leaders to create a, basically a Syrian government in exile. And the problem with that is that the Turks are pushing uh, for the Muslim brothers to be the leaders of this movement, saying that they have the, the organization within Syria. Uh, and also remember that the Turks, they have been pressing for the Muslim brothers' support of, of uh, Morsi in Egypt. So the Muslim brother governments are seen by the Turkish government as friendly to Erdogan and his AK party. So they're pushing for that. Meanwhile, the Saudis are just adamant. They do not want any brothers involved. And so they start pushing for the, the free Syrian army, which they think will be um, more secular. And this is odd, right? You think, well, why is a Wahhabi state supporting what they think is a more secular group against a Muslim brother group? Well, the simple answer is, I've said this to you before, is that the, the Saudi Arabia is afraid of the brothers because the brothers are, uh, don't like monarchies. They want a, an Islamic republic and basically they want people to vote and the, the royal family would be voted out. So they, they, don't want, they don't want the brothers to win. So for them, if you have a choice of secular brothers, take the secular. And so that leads to paralysis in the, uh, the Syrian and abroad. Uh, and they never ever get their act together. There are competing organizations. There's one now, in Istanbul. there still is one in Istanbul. There's one in Cairo. Uh, there are in Europe. Uh, they just, there is no, they, they do not speak with a unified voice. So in the midst of this, we get where the Iraq war comes in. And here I'm gonna kind of step back a little bit because what happens in 2012, is that uh, Bashar al-Assad and his advisors say, well, let's, let's, let's demolish this international coalition that is building that's wanting to get rid of us. How do we do that? We raise the specter that if we go, the extreme Islamist from like Iraq, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, will take over in Syria. And it'll be so much worse for you guys in the West. All right, so what, what led us to this point? We have to go back to 2005 
in the Iraq War. So in 2005, in the Iraq War, a uh, the United States is heating up. Do you remember the Shia? The United States is fighting the remnants of uh, Saddam Hussein's army, which have turned into guerrillas. Uh, and they're also starting to fight with the Muqtada Southern's uh, Shia militia. So 2005 is a pretty bad year for the United States in Iraq. You know, we're, we're getting many more casualties than we got. I think it's the worst year in terms of of, uh, of casualties <clears throat> in fighting in Iraq was 2005. And in the into this mix comes a guy who calls himself uh, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. So he's a Jordanian whose real name is not that, but that's what he's known as, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. Uh, he had formed a group that was known as the Jamaat al-Tawheed wa Jihad in Jordan in 1999. So that meant the organization of the Declaration of the Unity of God. So Tawheed, I mentioned that already. That's the idea that, that God is one and, and uh, anyone who doesn't say that is a heretic and they shall be killed. And that includes people who say anything about Ali, it includes Christians. Uh, anybody who, who denies the ultimate unity of God is, is uh, a heretic and has to be killed. And so it was called Jamaat to Tawheed wa Jihad. So let's fight the Jihad to you know, wipe out all those people that don't believe the way we believe. And he had declared loyalty to Al-Qaeda. So this is in 1999. So it's before the, the uh, Twin Towers bombing. And so he then takes his group uh, to Iraq in 2005 uh, because uh, he then declares that he is the Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And what is interesting is, uh, in terms of the formation of this new movement, which will morph into ISIS, is that who joins this movement? It is the old Iraqi uh, officer corps. So you get these uh, ideologically um, very extreme Muslim uh, people, but you also get these very secular uh, generals and colonels who had no interest in Islam whatsoever, but who wanted to fight the Americans. And so they link up. So you get the kind of the um, enthusiasm or the fanaticism of the true believers, but you also get the organizational skills and tactical skills of the old Iraqi military, which the United States had disbanded. And some people say that was probably the dumbest thing the Americans did in their occupation in 2003 was we disbanded the Iraqi army and gave them no salaries or anything like that. And so they, the officer corps all basically joined the resistance against the American. Uh, so those guys are in this movement. And so you get this, you know, really strange combination of, of people that you, you have to, dis to understand it. You have to go back to the old Middle Eastern saying, the enemy, my enemy is my friend. You know, so the, 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 we make strange bedfellows Politics made strange bedfellows, so they linked up together. Now, what made it even worse, and this is where Syria comes in, is that the Syrian regime is no friend of the United States, and it sees the turmoil in, Syria, in Iraq as a good thing. And so uh, from 2005 until 2009, Syria was basically an open port that any Arab could come under, because of the Ba'ath ideology the Arabs can come to Syria, any Arab can come to Syria without a visa, without a passport even, as long as he has an identity card from his home country or her home country. And so uh, they allowed in people from Tunisia, from Algeria, from uh, Egypt, uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, from all over the Arab world. And what the, um, what Zarqawi was trying to do was create, remember back in the, when they tried to create a, an Islamic war against the Russians in, uh, in or the Soviets in Afghanistan, and they were recruiting people from all over the young men from all over the Muslim world, especially the Arab world, who were going to Afghanistan to fight. Well, that was Iraq in 2005, 2006, 2007. You had uh, literally tens of thousands of young men. There were some women, but the women start to come later with the, to the Islamic State, but mostly men, young men coming from all across the Arab world. Uh, who are going then into Iraq to kill Americans, to fight the holy war against the Americans. And so uh, Zarqawi is killed in 2006, and then who takes over? Is Abu Bakr uh, al-Baghdadi. So he's an Iraqi, he's declaring he's Iraqi because his surname, I mean his last name, and these people are all taking these nom de guerre, so these war names. They usually are identified by their where they come from. 
So there was the famous one in Yemen who was called El Amriki because he was a son of Yemeni immigrants in the United States who had gone back to Yemen to join the Al Qaeda in, in Yemen. And he was called El Amriki because he was American. And so they take the, as their kind of war names, they take as what we would call their last name, is a, a signifier of where they come from. So Zarqawi was from Zarqa, which is a town in, in Jordan. Baghdadi, he's claiming to be from Baghdad. And then his taking the name Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr is the first uh, Sunni caliph. So that's a, about as Sunni name as you can possibly take. So he is, he was evidently recruited into this organization when he was in Abu Ghraib prison. I mentioned that, the American prison in Iraq. He is recruited into the more radical groups. So he takes control and he fights the fight against the Americans. And as I mentioned uh, in the lecture on Iraq, eventually the <coughs> Americans win through the help of the tribes and the um, uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq breaks up, flees, some of them stay, they go in hiding in Iraq. Uh, but some of the one, the foreign ones go back into Syria. Well, in Syria, then they're arrested. Lots of them are arrested and put in prison by the Assad regime because Assad doesn't want these radical Muslims wandering around the streets of, of Syria. So some of the foreign ones are deported back to their home countries. Others, like I said, are arrested. And all those who were Syrians uh, were arrested. Okay, so flash forward. We're in 2012. And one of the things that uh, Bashar al-Assad and his supporters want to do is, you know, they say, well, we're liberal, we're gonna let people out of prison. We're gonna let out, we're gonna let out political prisoners. Uh, and, you know, the West, oh, that's, that's a positive step. But what he did is he didn't let out the liberals, he didn't let out the you know, college students, he let out the, the radical Islamists. And he was a very calculated step because he, he knew that they're going to go to the front lines and fight me. They're going to go join the resistance in uh, northern Syria uh, or in Homs against my regime. But they're going to be so fanatic that they're going to turn off the West and the West will be afraid of them. So the West won't care whether we suppress the rebellion or not. In fact, they will welcome welcome the fact that we suppress the rebellion. So it was a very calculated move. And when you combine that with the fact that the United States uh, with Obama did not want to get involved in Syria in any way, shape or form. Uh, the Libya thing was still hanging over people obviously. Uh, and he just didn't want to do it. But the, the opposition, they pretty much felt that that would be the only thing that would save them. And so when he made his his thing about the red line, that no poison gas, then everyone was pretty sure that the um, uh, Americans would intervene. And by 2012, 2013, the, uh, the, it was going bad for the Syrian regime. The Syrian regime, um, some estimates by, again, by people I know in the State Department um, said that uh, the Syrian army, which probably was around 350,000, was maybe down to 100,000, not because of so much of casualties, but because of desertion and the fact that nobody was showing up for their draft notices. So no, no, nobody, people, people started fleeing. In fact, a large number of the people who end up in Germany are people who give us the reason they fled as they're young men of draft age and they're gone to Germany to avoid the draft in Syria. Uh, so uh, they're having trouble getting their, their forces. And uh, so they revert, or they resort, I should say, to very extreme measures, which include using poison gas, chlorine gas, and barrel bombs. The barrel bombs are easy to make, low technology. What they do is they fill up um, barrel, uh, petroleum barrels, empty petroleum barrels with, um, you know, fragmented metal, put a high amount of, of dynamite in them, and then drop them out of helicopters because the the Americans put a ban on the Syrian rev, rebels getting anti-aircraft rockets. The Turks wanted to supply them, the, the Saudis wanted to supply them, but the Americans, because the anti-aircraft rockets actually are very effective even against you know high-level American jets, uh, the Americans did not want um, radical Muslims to get hold of anti-aircraft rockets. So the, the the rebels never had those, still don't have those. 
uh, and the uh, the government then can use helicopters, which are low maintenance, and they can fly over the zone that they want to bomb and drop out these barrel bombs. And they basically think of a, a, of a you know a, a fragmented grenade or something, a huge on a huge scale. You drop it in the middle of a, of a city square or town square, and it wipes out dozens of people. Uh, so it's an anti-personnel mine. It doesn't destroy buildings that much, but it destroys. But then they're also bombing heavily, and they're using artillery. So you start to, if you see films of, of places like Hama, I'm sorry, Homs or Aleppo, they look like post-World War II German cities. I mean, there's mile after mile of um, gutted buildings. Uh, so there's tremendous amount of, of loss. Uh, and the then in, in, in um, August of, of 2013, uh, they, they use it, the, there's documented case by the UN that the Syrian regime uses poison gas on a suburb of Damascus. And uh, all Obama does is he says, well, okay, um, Syria has to uh, abide by the UN rules that no, no, uh, no chemical weapons. And so Syria said, yeah, we'll do that. And Russia will guarantee it. Russia will, 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 Russia will collect them and then we'll give, you, give them to the Americans. Uh, we'll take them out to sea. The Americans will, will meet the Americans' boats and we'll put them on the American boats. The Americans go take them and destroy them. All right, so Obama said, okay. Now we now know that it was only a fraction of what was delivered. I mean, why did, you know, why did Americans think the Russians would do it? Because Russia, you know, at this point had not yet come in completely on the side of Syria, but it was blocking any any votes against the Syrian government in the United Nations were being blocked by the Russians and the Chinese. Uh, and so um, Obama said, okay, he walks away. Most people think that had he bombed, even just strategically bombed uh, air bases uh, in the fall of 2013, the Syrian regime would have collapsed. Um, what would have happened? And that was by this time, see, by 2013, because the Islamists have been let out of prison by 2013, the Islamists had formed several very um, effective front uh, groups. Uh, the most famous is the Nusra Front, which accepts the leadership of Al Qaeda. So, rightly, Americans are afraid of Al Nusra. Uh, the Nusra Front um, is, is one of the most effective fighting forces that the rebels have. And so, increasingly, the rebel group looks sectarian. And this is a point that needs to be emphasized. In 2011 and in 2012, the opposition in Syria wasn't easily identifiable as Sunni. Yes, there were most of the people involved were Sunni, but then most Syrians were Sunni. There were Christians, there were Druze, and there were even some Alawis, uh, intellectuals, who were supporting the call for greater democracy in Syria. But by 2013, that was changing. And the Islamic elements were winning. The Free Syrian Army was becoming, was weaker and weaker. Um, Obama tried to give some weapons to them, but those all got end up being captured by the Nusra Front, which I said much more effective, much more deadly, much more lethal uh, group. Um, and so the Americans don't do anything. And then that opens the door for the Russians to come in, and more importantly, Iran. Iran had been having advisors to, uh, to uh, Syria uh, before 2013, but in the fall of 2013, we start to get, I mentioned this earlier, the Quds Brigade, which is the special guard of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard. So those are the guys that are led by Qasem Soleimani. Uh, they, Qasem Soleimani arrives in, in Syria, and some of the Syrian government defectors from that time say that, in fact, Qasem Soleimani was the ruler of Syria, that um, Bashar al-Assad was no longer calling the shots, that Qasem Soleimani was calling the shots. And the other thing that happened in 2013 was in Hezbollah, uh, in Lebanon, decides to send its militias uh, into uh, Syria. And the, the, the Popular Front uh, militias that had been formed among the Shia in Iraq uh, under Qasem Soleimani's guidance, they also went to, to, uh, um, to Syria. Uh, and so you start to get a much more um, sectarian tone in, in the Sunni press, especially in Al Jazeera. There is a, a Syrian... Uh, 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 
cleric who was very popular on uh, Al Jazeera, a guy named El, El, El Qardawi. And he, in 2013, starts to talk about the Shia threat, that uh, Iran is trying to exterminate the Sunnis. And it then, it starts to have a very sectarian tone. And that's when Saudis start to try to say, well, this is a war. The Iranians are trying to, to create their dream of a Shia world, a, a Middle East dominated by the Shia, the Lebanon and Syria, Iraq are all part of this, their, their grand scheme, scheme plan. Um, and Sunnis need to rally. Well, the Sunni governments don't. I mean, Egypt, uh, as I said, one of the reasons Egypt probably collapsed, or the army probably moved in 2013, was because at the, uh, the anniversary of the revolution in uh, out of the election of, of um, Mohammed Morsi, he made the speech saying that the Egyptians were free to go to Syria if they wanted to. So the army moved not long after that. So the Egyptian army doesn't want any part of what's going on in Syria, uh, doesn't want Egyptians to go uh, to Syria to fight. Uh, and so, but others do. So I mentioned Tunis, a uh, large number of Tunisians start to go, a relatively large number of the population, people from the Caucasus Mountains start to go from Central Asia. So it starts to turn into the Afghanistan of the 2010. So where Afghanistan had been seen as the battleground of um, Muslims against evil Soviets, uh, Syria becomes the battleground of Sunnis versus Shia. And this is a very sad development because it, uh, it does create great, <coughs> greater intensity of violence that's meted out uh, Sunnis against Shia, Shia against Sunnis. Uh, that had been, Zarqawi had done that in Iraq. That was one of his tactics was to antagonize the, the Shia by blowing up Shia mosques, targeting Shia targets. And so, you know, it's hard to say who starts it, but once it's starting, it's getting, it accelerates. And also then the Islamist groups, uh, much to the horror of the West, they start targeting Christians, just like they did in uh, Iraq. And so uh, the, even more so, the regime is putting itself out as the protector of minorities, that it is the only Arab country where there are Christians and, and, and other groups that are allowed to practice their religion and it becomes very prominent whenever they, they make speeches. There's always a guy, a priest in a you know, clerical gown that's there on the side to show that this is true, the Christians are, are being protected. Um, but it is clear that the Christian population was leaving. Um, the Christians, uh, especially are concentrated in the north and Aleppo and Idlib, the province is still under the rule of, of the Nusra Front. Um, and so the Christians are leaving, and one of the ways they went was uh, Canada. And Canada was very generous in opening its doors to Syrian refugees, uh, the most generous country in the world, other than Germany. And but over 50% of the refugees they were taking were Christians, and so they were actually getting well-educated people. Uh, they were it was going to enrich Canada. Canada would be richer because it took refugees. We at that time were taking almost no one, and now we're taking no one. And even when we were taking refugees, we were, we were tending to take refugees because of their women without husbands and lots of children needed help. And those were people that are going to be you know, kind of dependent. So Canada and Australia both wisely chose refugees with skills um, where America didn't take many refugees to begin with and those they took, you know, I think, I don't know. Anyway, I won't go into that. Uh, so um, uh, the Christian population is shrinking. Uh, and, um, but those who were remained, whenever they had a voice, whenever European or American correspondent found them, they always very firmly stated that they were for the regime. Uh, so it, it caused, it created problems. And then finally in 20, uh, not finally, but in 2014, uh, uh, the, uh, the, Daesh emerges, and so we call it, the United States usually calls it ISIS, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, um, the, or sometimes the Islamic State. Muslims don't like to call it that because they don't like to call, uh, Muslims who aren't, aren't members of it, and so they, they, that, that puts it as too Islamic and they're extremists, they're not. A, so the Arabs and people, even in speaking English in European countries, they often will call it Daesh. And that is the that stand, that's the Arab acronym of the Dawlat al-Islamiyya bi-Iraq al-Sham, 
and the reason the Arabs use that is dash doesn't mean anything. But if you hear it, I mean, just think of dash, you know, <laughs> it sounds, it sounds kind of bad, you know, ah. Uh, so dash is how the Arabs, the non-dash people call it, is dash. Uh, and they do that, like I said, because they don't want to say Islamic State. And they don't want to call it, give it, you know, merit as being an Islamic State. All right, so they're, they're formed in Syria, and they start to take over in uh, 2014. Uh, they take over the towns of Raqqa and Derizor, then the Euphrates Valley, and then they move, they make this wild dash, dash makes a dash, dash makes a dash into Iraq, and they take uh, Mosul, the, the second largest city of Iraq, and in 2015. And that, the, the, the Iraqi government basically collapses because the, the um, the government had been corrupt, Shia, the uh, patronage of Iran, and the army just collapsed. And so it almost looked like the Daesh was going to go to Baghdad. They definitely were moving into the Kurdish areas. And the Kurds then mobilize the Peshmerga. And they then, uh, with American help, uh, bombing American stops and troops at this point, with American help, they, they stop them in the north, and then in the south, the, the various brigades, the, the, the popular mobilization brigades, Shia popular mobilization brigades move out, and they then put a halt to it. But in the summer of 2015, it looked almost as if Baghdad would fall, they, the dash was that close. And what they were finding as they came into that area, so Mosul down to Baghdad, that's the Sunni Arab heartland of Iraq. And what they were, what people were finding was that because the Iraqi government um, had been so uh, Shia uh, partisan that the Sunnis didn't care. They, you know, Daesh comes, that's better than what we have. And so they either didn't help the government or they actually helped Daesh. And so it really was the Americans had to come back in and the Americans started then to activate those relationships that they had with the tribes, the Sunni tribes, and that eventually will, will halt the Daesh uh, uh, movement. And then by um, 2018, uh, the Daesh has been pushed out of all of Iraq. Uh, and um, uh, the, uh, this in the Syrian cities too, they're taking. So in this mix, again, we have a lot of complicated factors. So the United States sends in troops, small numbers, but advisors to the Iraqis. So we start to restore our relationship with the Iraqi army, which I think is still there. Then so the Iraqi and Shia are demanding American leave Iraq, but the Americans have said, well, we're just gonna go to our bases. And it sounds like the Iraqi army, that's what they want too, because they want the American advisors to stay. Uh, the Kurds, we renew our friendship with the Kurds in northern Iraq, but then we have in Syria one of the most effective, besides um, the, uh, the Nusra Front, the most effective fighting force is a group called the YPG, and that is uh, the initials of the Kurdish word uh, Yenginian Parastinagel, which means the, the People's Protection and Unity, I'm sorry, pre People's Protection Units. Uh, and that is a group that is allied to PKK. So you get a, a Kurdish nationalist group that's Marxist, and I saw a film last year for one of their funerals, and they had pictures of Abdullah Öcalan, the, the PKK leader, but they also had pictures of Marx and Lenin, so it's, and there's no question that they're Marxist. But the United States still said, well, they're against the, they're against uh, Daesh, so we'll help them. And that infuriated the Turks. The Turks were just that we're, we're still livid about that, that the United States would help people who were PKK uh, sympathizers. And then, as I mentioned in the lecture on Turkey, then you start to get, after 2015, you start to get trouble again between the PKK and the Turks, Turkish government in southeastern Turkey and the lockdown of some Turkish cities by the army, and then the you know, open fighting between the PKK and the Turkish army. Um, that was brought on in part by the United States supplying weapons to the the YPG and the YPG then sending the weapons to uh, the PKK. So it gets really complicated and the uh, United States did not show any great wisdom in how it, either under Obama or under uh, Trump, I would say they're equal. I would say that, I mean, I, you know, I would say 
I will openly say it, I was pretty much an Obama supporter, but the one thing that I think Obama really got wrong was the whole American policy in Syria. Uh, okay, so that then leads us to uh, today. Today we, we are able, thanks to the Kurds and thanks to the reorganization of the Iraqi army, we're able pretty much to, to crush Daesh. They don't have any territory uh, directly under their control. But they have morphed so that the, the you have Al Qaeda uh, in in Yemen, you have Al Qaeda in uh, Somalia, you have Al Qaeda in West Africa, you have Al Qaeda in the Philippines. So all of those groups, and you still have in Syria. So what we well, let me, so we we pushed them out of the out of Raqqa and Derazor, and so then the last area that remains under rebel control in Syria, other than the Kurdish region, the Kurdish region is still under the YPG. That's the northeastern part. In fact, it's pretty much, if you look at a map of Syria, it's pretty much all the territory uh, to the north and east of Euphrates River. Um, the government has reestablished control in Derazor, but not in Raqqa. Raqqa is under the control of the Kurds. And then if you look at a map in Syria, there's up in the northern corner, there's a town called Kamishli, near the Iraqi-Syrian-Turkish border. That's in government hands. But all the rest of that area is under uh, YPG, except for an area that last year um, Trump allowed the Turks to move in. The Turks took a strip of territory from Euphrates east, about 50 miles and 10 miles deep. And that area is under Turkish military occupation. Uh, if you go to the Euphrates River west, that is all under uh, control now of the government, except for the area known as Idlib province. Idlib province is in the northwest. If you look at where Turkey has a thumb kind of sticks down into uh, Syria, on the side of the thumb, uh, looks kind of a corner there, that's Idlib province. And that province had a, a Kurdish minority and the Kurds took control of their cities and they allow the Turks moved into those places. Uh, and then the rest of the province is in the hand of the Nusra and so, the whole question is what's going to happen there. It looked like last winter they were going to push into it. And it's going to be a, tr a problem because the, the province itself wasn't that uh, populated. But as uh, towns were retaken by the government, they often made a deal with the rebels that if the rebels left, they would let them go. And so they're in Idlib. So Idlib has something like two and a half million refugees. Uh, living in that province that are from other parts of Syria that left when the government established control. So you have a, a like a, a little enclave of um, of Syrian resistance that unfortunately is, is dominated by Nusra. There are some free Syrian army units in there as well. And I don't know what that future is. Whenever that happens, um, whenever that, I would imagine after the COVID-19 Thing, when it passes, if it passes, then the, the Syrians and the Russians will move again. Because what, what has happened, and the other thing I didn't mention, you have the Russian, I'm sorry, the Iranian involvement. You also have the Russians. The Russians came in very heavily, again, after. They initially came in to help take away the, the so-called chemical weapons, but then they stayed. And there had always been a Russian naval base in Tartus. That goes back to Soviet times. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, the only foreign base that the Soviet Russians maintained was the port at Tartus. It was run down. There weren't that many Russians left there, but it still was a Russian base. Uh, and the Russians then, the Syrians, gave the Russians an air base in northern Syria in 2013. And so since then, the Russians have been very active in helping the, um, the regime uh, more uh, bombing rather than troops, although there was one incident where American special forces fought Russian. And what the Russians are doing is something similar to the Americans. They're not using regular Russian army. Americans in Iraq, we, we let Black Hawk, I mean, whatever that was called, the, the special ops people, the, the private companies, we, we use those guys. Well, that's what the Russians are doing. So the, there are units of Russians who are theoretically mercenaries paid for by who knows whom, uh, but are actually paid for by the Russian state. And they are the, the military that's uh, on boots on the ground in, in Syria, Russian boots on the ground. And there was, a, I think last year, there was a, about this time last year, there was an incident where they came up against the American Special Forces and the Americans bombed them, wiped out about over 100 Russians. So there's always potential. Uh, like I said, uh, what will happen in Idlib is, is the, 
you know, un unanswered question. And then the, the big unanswered question is what's going to happen to Syria. And uh, there are people who say that the, the Syrian government is probably very happy that the country, I mean, they're not happy the country was destroyed, but in the process of destroying the country, they got rid of, of uh, well over 5 million uh, Syrians. Uh, the overwhelming majority of those Syrians who left are Sunnis. So that the balance now, if you take the Christians and the uh, Alawis and the Druzes and stuff, you're starting to get a, a much larger percentage of the population. And the majority will still be Sunnis. Uh, and especially if they let go of the Kurdish region, which is a possibility, they will have a more compact country, which is what they kind of wanted anyway. Uh, and that, you know, they'll, who knows how long they'll be in power. The question is who's going to rebuild it? And that is, there is no one. Um, the Russians do not have the resources. It is unimaginable that the Saudis would give any money to support uh, the Assad regime. Iran clearly doesn't have any money. The Europeans uh, will be very hesitant to help uh, Assad after this record that he has established of uh, war crimes uh, that is unquestionable that uh, people have been tortured and murdered and, you know, Terrible things have happened in Syria during this time that was done by the government. I mean, terrible things were done by Nusra, but the point is that Nusra wasn't a government and the Syrian government is a government uh, recognized by every, almost everybody. Uh, so that is an open question. I think it's gonna plague you guys your whole lives. You'll be hearing about things happening in Syria and Syrians, you know, I just can't see a, a rosy end to that. I, you know, I. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I think Iraq has a better chance of pulling out of this than Syria does. And I mentioned when we talked my last lecture about the the um, Arab fall in Iraq and Arab autumn. Uh, that is, you're starting to see Iraqis pulling together as Iraqis, and that's something you haven't seen in Syria. Um, just the fact that you have two Syrian flags. You have the flag of the regime, and you have the the flag that the rebels are using, which is the flag of the old Syrian Republic. Whereas in Iraq, everybody agrees they have the same flag. So, I mean, it, I mean, this is symbolic, but it's saying that there is a more of a, a unity in the state in Iraq than there, there is in Syria. And I just, given how brutal it was in, in, in Syria and how it, it degenerated into a sectarian um, fight, uh, I just, I have a hard time imagining that it will repair itself, but it is possible by just saying, that if you want to take something away from this lesson, from this class, is keep your eyes on Syria. Um, because it's, it's not its value, but its potential for disruption is immense uh, in the region. So I'll leave it there. It's kind of a pessimistic note. That's why I generally don't, if, you know, for my choice, I would only teach uh, classical Islam because that's, that's a, more of an optimistic uh, subject than this. 20th century Middle East and 21st century Middle East is a relatively pessimistic uh, subject. Uh, I would just leave it though with one optimistic note. I have a, I, you know, I've lived in the Middle East. I love the people in the Middle East. I love its culture. And I hope that it can repair itself. I think it maybe can, I hope so. If you look at Lebanon, uh, Lebanon has largely repaired itself um, from its civil war. So maybe it's possible for Syria. And let's just, all right, I'll end on a happy note. We, we, we will be optimistic that just as Lebanon was eventually able to more or less emerge uh, after its horrible civil war, then hopefully Syria will as well. Now, I'll end then with the um, information about the final. Uh, I have been told by the registrar's office that I can, anyone who is taking this course for a grade, I will have the option when I, when I get the grade sheet online, that I'll have the option to convert it to credit. So if you want your final grade to be credit, uh, you need to let me know um, soon. Um, so that's one. It can't go the other way, I'm told. So in other words, if you, you chose credit and you decided you want a grade, you can't, I can't do that. But I can if you've decided, if you're down for, for a letter grade, I can, I will have the option when I have your grade sheet to, to put credit rather than a grade. And so if you want that, I think one or two people have already let me know they want that. Let me know and I will do that. Uh, as I said, the, the exam itself, 
will be available on Wednesday. It'll be on um, uh, format. Will it be on? It'll be blocking it. It'll be on Moodle. That's what it'll be on. So look under the Moodle for the week, and you'll see it as a click on, and it'll be as I said, it'll be uh, three prompts. Uh, which will pretty much cover the whole history of the 20th century and the 21st century. So a big picture. And uh, three of them, you will write on two of them. I'm asking that you write about two pages typewritten for each one. So that's about uh, 500 words um, per question. So a thousand total. So about four pages, which I figure you can do in your isolation. It's open book. You can have any time you want. Uh, I will grade them based not so much on the information, but on the quality of your argument. Because um, you have open books, so it's not like you have to know facts and look them up. Uh, so it's a, a quality of your argument. Uh, you have until, I will give you until the, the following Friday, which is the hmm, calendar. Yeah. Uh, the 15th that is has to be all, um, for seniors that has to be no no quibbling uh, others you can get in a little bit later than that because um, I think they're accepting grades for non seniors beyond that so you need to get the the, the exams into me by the 15th and then I'd like to say in closing that I'm, I'm sorry that this semester ended this way I'm sorry for those of you who are seniors I'm sorry for the, all of you because I, I realize how much uh, being on campus, being able to talk to your fellow students, being able to use the library, being able to come in and see me, to ask me things face to face, be able to interact in the classroom, all of those things, even though this is just a lecture course, all of those things that we do in person make the class classes at Wesleyan much richer. So I'm sorry that it ended this way for you. I'm, I'm sorry it ended this way for me because as I mentioned to you at the beginning of the semester, this is my last class that I'll be teaching at Wesleyan. And so I'm, again, I'm sorry that I'm not here to say goodbye to you personally, but I will say goodbye to you. And I hope that you have good futures, that you are, those of you who are returning to Wesleyan, I hope they're still discussing what the nature of the, of the school, um, uh, will be, whether it'll be open or whether it'll be like long distance and they don't know yet. Um, I'm hoping that it will be, well, we'll just have to see what the disease does. But I, I do hope that you continue, those of you who are returning will continue to have a rich uh, experience at Wesleyan. So with that, I'll say goodbye. And good luck.